on Superstars this time. Five performers who've consistently dared to be different. The daughter of a director father and a screenwriting mother, Maggie Gyllenhaal isn't known for playing it safe. In her breakthrough role in the 2002 film Secretary, she agreed to appear nude for the part of a self-harming, submissive Lee Holloway, who becomes involved in a sadomasochistic relationship with her boss. She later admitted, however, that she did initially have qualms about the script, but she placed her trust in director Steven Shainberg and ended up scoring a Golden Globe nomination. She'd earned her right to star in the film by playing a supporting role in the film that made her younger brother Jake a cult hero, Donnie Darko. She'd also appeared in films like Cecil B. Demented and Riding in Cars with Boys, and starred in the Berkeley Repertory Theatre's production of Patrick Marber's Closer. Since The Secretary, her eclectic choice of films has included Spike Jonze's surreal satire adaptation and George Clooney's directorial debut, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. Outside of her film career, Maggie has been an outspoken political activist. In 2001, she drew criticism for her comments on the September 11 attacks. In an interview, she was quoted as saying that the US had done reprehensible things and was responsible in some way. She has since toned down the remarks and when cast as the real-life wife of a firefighter in Oliver Stone's 2006 film World Trade Center, she sought the blessing of the woman she was hired to portray before accepting the part. Is Daddy coming home? Honey. I don't know. I really wanted to honor her back. Um, but I guess I, I didn't think the best way to do that was to imitate her or to try to recreate exactly her memory of that day. Instead, I, I felt like the way to do that, the way I could really honor her was by, um, you know, just trying to be as brave as I could be as an actress in the scenes that I was in. And so I did, I did get to know her and I did, um, I, I was really inspired by her, but I, I never went about it trying to imitate her. You know, I, I never grilled her for everything that happened that day or how she felt or what color nail polish she was wearing. She found much deeper similarities between her and the real life Alison Umano, who'd been pregnant at the time of the attacks. Maggie herself fell pregnant to longtime partner Peter Sarsgaard while making the film. There's another movie coming out too that's all about me being a mom. <laughs> you know, I, I guess you know it's like w w whatever. Sometimes when things are on my mind, they lead me toward projects, and I think that must have been what happened with these couple of movies. The other movie she was referring to took her into even more turbulent territory as a recovering addict who has just been released from prison where she spent three years for robbery to support her heroin addiction and who is now trying to re-establish a relationship with her young daughter. Mommy? Hi. Where were you? Playing such an unsympathetic character in Sherry Baby presented a very positive challenge. If you can make a movie about somebody who's really, really broken and really, really troubled, who a lot of the times when you're watching it, you know, you don't like, you're not sure if you're going to root for her or not, and yet, Ultimately, you can still feel compassion for her. After years of appearing in mostly independent and offbeat films, she was finally persuaded to sign up for a mainstream blockbuster by Batman director Christopher Nolan. Everybody knows Chris Nolan's a really fantastic director, and if you look at the cast of who's in it, you know, Christian Bale and Aaron Eckhart and Gary Oldman and Morgan Freeman and, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, so that, that's like the obvious thing to say, and that, that is true. And once she started working on the movie, she was reassured that the story of the Dark Knight was not your typical lightweight crowd pleaser. Every bit of my experience so far on this movie has, has, has been so great and so much like working on any of the other movies that have interested me in my life. And I am, I do think it'd be really, it's going to be really awesome to, you know, like fly through the air and we, you know, enveloped by Batman.
Another actor who's not afraid of taking risks is Adrian Brody. The self-confessed avid daredevil has broken his nose three times and was lucky not to have died in a motorcycle accident in 1992. His devotion to method acting, along with his multiple nasal fractures, have led to frequent comparisons to legendary odd-looking actors like Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. And in 2002, the 29-year-old from Queens proved he was worthy of the comparisons when he accepted the role of a Polish Jew fighting for survival in a devastated Warsaw ghetto in The Pianist. And you? What do you do? Oh, I finished at the conservatoire. Oh, you're a musician. Yes. But only just. I'm sorry. What instrument? The cello. Oh, I love to see a woman playing the cello. He's a, he's a remarkable human being and someone who had to endure so much and somehow managed to hang on, managed to not only have this tremendous will to survive, but maintain his dignity along the way. To prepare for the harrowing role, Adrian reportedly cut himself off from his friends and family, as well as most of his creature comforts. I had to spend a great deal of time in isolation and encourage a sense of sadness and encourage a sense of deprivation. And the way you do that is deprive yourself of mm. the things that you love and the people that you love. The true story of one man's phenomenal will to stay alive during the Second World War transformed Adrian into the youngest man ever to win an Academy Award for Best Actor. He also became the first American ever to win a Caesar Award in France. Such honors, however, did not immediately guarantee him continued leading man status. In 2003's Singing Detective, he found himself well down the pecking order playing First Hood, and in M. Night Shyamalan's The Village, he played a supporting role as a young man with developmental problems. It was a dreadful sound. Our days of peace are over. In 2005, he was on hand as part of an ensemble cast to turn Peter Jackson's childhood ambition into a reality in a remake of King Kong. Finally, in 2006, he regained his top billing to play a private investigator hired to look into the apparent suicide of 1950s Superman actor George Reeves. What, the guy used to play Superman, he shot himself, what? Someone thinks he didn't. Oh, yeah? The trip back in time to Hollywood's golden age threw up inevitable comparisons between then and now. It was a glamorous time, um, probably more glamorous than today in a lot of ways. I think movie stars and the studio system were at their heyday. And, but I think, uh, I don't know, there's, a, there's an element of mystery to it. Uh, the business was new. Having won an Oscar at the age of 29 and then watched his career take an immediate dip, Adrian was all too aware of the fickle nature of the film industry and the fragility of fame that led to the demise of George Reeves. After Hollywoodland, however, Adrian cemented his leading man status by starring in the biopic of Manuel Rodriguez Sanchez, Manalete. While preparing for the role of the legendary bullfighter, he met and fell in love with Spanish actress Elsa Pataki. And while Adrian is the big star in America, the tables are turned in Elsa's home country. In Spain, for example, it's, it's completely different. It's more and more like they're crazy with coming and making me photos. I'm the, he's my boyfriend in Spain, which is funny. After making his name playing rather serious roles, Adrian was thrilled to finally be allowed to lighten up in the Wes Anderson comedy Darjeeling Limited, alongside the infamous trickster Owen Wilson. Owen, Owen is, is a, has a tremendous sense of humor, and he's very mischievous. And when I'm around mischievous people, I become more mischievous. You don't love me! Yes, I do! I love you too, but I'm going to mace you in the face! But that didn't really pan out. He's also been using his acting talents to create mischief on the celebrity poker circuit, but admits that just as in the film industry, success in cards has a lot to do with Lady Luck. There is obviously the element of luck. Um, you can have tremendous strategy, but if luck isn't on your side that night, you know, it's, it's very hard to win. At 
the age of 24, Claire Danes was already a veteran of film and television when she played Meryl Streep's daughter in The Hours. But that didn't stop her from being starstruck by the two-time Oscar winner. The native New Yorker had first come to fame in the TV teen drama My So-Called Life as Angela Chase. She appeared in films like How to Make an American Quilt and Home for the Holidays, before landing a starring role opposite Leonardo DiCaprio in Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet in 1996. My little brother... A host of eclectic roles followed as she made the transition to adult actress. She played a young woman framed for drug dealing in a Thai prison in Broke Down Palace, the valiant Cosette in Les Miserables, and the terminally bored Suki Saperstein in Igby Goes Down. In 2003, she got the chance to really test her mettle in the long-awaited third installment of the Terminator franchise, Rise of the Machines, directed by Jonathan Mosto. As vet Kate Brewster, she gets caught in the crossfire as the dastardly TX attempts to assassinate humankind's only hope, John Connor. <laughs> At the UK premiere, she was asked if she would be tempted back into the action. I don't know, that's not at all resolved, but if Jonathan participated, I would be really comfortable trying another one because I really believe in him as a filmmaker and we have a strong relationship. One relationship that turned out to be on the wane was her six-year romance with Australian singer-songwriter Ben Lee, which ended after they starred together in Rage in Placid Lake. Where is he? Claire then hit the headlines for starting up a relationship with actor Billy Crudup, who had just left his pregnant girlfriend Mary Louise Parker. In 2005, the controversy was neatly deflected onto her on-screen role in Shop Girl, in which she played a department store assistant who becomes locked in a love triangle with an elderly wealthy charmer played by Steve Martin and a struggling young musician played by Jason Schwartzman. Hey, I mean, hello. Hi, I'm Jeremy. I'm an okay guy, by the way. Characterize her as a plain Jane. Um, she's receding. She's uh, she's shy. She's she's timid and unsure of herself. She becomes a lot less so over the course of the story, and I think that's that's um, that's the point. I mean, that's where that's the growth. That's the conflict that she's working through. Although the film received many negative reviews, directing Steve and Claire was an absolute joy for Annan Tucker. It was all fun. I mean, you know, first of all, you get to work with Steve Martin, who's been a hero of mine. And, you know, L.A. Story is one of my favorite movies of all time. Then you get to work with Claire Danes, one of the best actors working in the world. She's a genius, I think. Although Claire embraced the chance to work with one of the world's finest comedians, Shop Girl, which Steve Martin also wrote, brought out his more serious side. We think of him as so funny, and he is. He's an exceptional comic, a virtuosic comic, but there's something really tender and earnest and sensitive about him, too, that is really resonant and, and like, at play in this movie. However, Claire did get to flex her comedy muscles in her next movie, as Sarah Jessica Parker's younger sister in The Family Stone. And in 2007, she embraced her inner child to play the falling star in the fantasy epic Stardust, alongside Robert De Niro and Michelle Pfeiffer. Excuse me, have you seen a fallen star anywhere? We're in a crater. This must be where it fell. Yeah, this is where I fell. You're the star. You're the star? Really? <laughs> wow. I got to wear some pretty amazing clothes and ride a unicorn, et cetera, et cetera. I just got to totally indulge my, my young six-year-old fantasy of what it is to be, you know, uh, you know, a, 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 a magical character. Having taken a year out of the big screen action in 2008, Claire's next big challenge will be to bring back the New York of 1937 in the period drama Me and Orson Welles, co-starring teen idol Zac Efron. One performer who could never be accused of playing it safe is shock rocker artist and director Marilyn Manson.
Braun Brian Hugh Warner in 1969, he studied music journalism before deciding to hit the stage himself. His stage name, combining Marilyn Monroe with murderer Charles Manson, was chosen to symbolize the ultimate disturbing dualism of American culture. He's since been dubbed Reverend Manson by Church of Satan founder Anton LaVey. His zombie makeup, spooky contact lenses, outlandish costumes and theatrical stage performances helped him and his band of the same name develop a cult following, which grew into a worldwide fan base. Rubbing politicians and religious leaders up the wrong way with his lyrical references to sex, drugs and violence helped the band to three platinum albums, two of which went to number one in America. Fanning the flames of controversy and handing the band maximum publicity ahead of their Croatian gig in 2005, protesters lobbied until the last minute in a desperate bid to cancel the concert. The gothic giant shrugged off the incident, but on arriving in London with his then fiance Dita von Tees, he laughed at the hypocrisy of the protests. Uh, some priests were trying to pay me not to play. But the hotel I was staying in, there were 12-year-old kids gambling and drinking beer, so I don't really see what my threat was, you know, so I don't like to gamble. I don't drink beer either. It's not good for my slender figure. He was given a warmer welcome at the annual Kerrang! Awards, where he was honored with the prestigious Icon Award. Completely well deserved, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Absolutely, you know. I mean, the thing about Manson that I've always liked is that, you know, he's, he's challenged the mores of America continuously through his music. And it's really important. There's a, a long, long history of, of satire and, and of challenge, challenging, basically, the society that we live in that goes back like 500 years within art. And Manson is, you know, spearheading all of that now. Having shaken things up with his music, the man in the makeup mask was preparing to take on the art world. He'd made a start to his painting career in 1999, when he claimed to have sold his five-minute concept pieces to drug dealers. In 2006, he was thinking much bigger, opening up an art gallery and selling his own watercolors. I use a children's watercolor kit for a lot of my paintings. That's why they're very bright. People probably imagine if I painted something, it would be like in dog feces or blood or something. But there is blood in some of them. But I, the only other medium that I have really incorporated recently is besides like other types of paint. I put it absent a lot of times in my paintings. Although he'd never intended to part with his paintings, he explained how he felt driven to share his art. I never intended for people to even see my paintings, let alone to separate with them. So it's, it's been quite a difficulty for me. But <clears throat> after it started to happen at, at first, then I realized that now I have to paint more paintings. It's, uh, I'm kind of obliged to be a painter. He was happy to whack price tags ranging from $8,000 to $35,000 on his infantile art, which he sells under the banner of the Celebritarian Corporation that boasts the slogan, we sell our shadow to those that stand in it. The next medium on his list was film. Phantasmagoria, The Visions of Lewis Carroll, produced, directed by and starring Marilyn Manson, has been in the pipeline since February 2006. It is a horror film, but it's, it's, it's hard to you know, really acknowledge that when you feel almost ashamed to associate yourself with a genre that becomes, you know, rather cliché, but it's um, then a challenge to redefine the genre. So we're going to make something that's very, very unsettling, but also very... I think it's, it's kind of uh, romantic in a way because he just has this obsession with the idea of a girl. And so she's more than just Alice, you know, she, she ends up playing like one person's obsession with every everything you could want in someone because he had no one and he, he died alone. And so it's, it's a very lonely story. The same couldn't be said for Marilyn, whose split from Dieter had barely hit the gossip pages when he was snapped canoodling with 19-year-old actress Evan Rachel Wood. 
The controversy deepened when the pair got hot and heavy in the video to Marilyn's 2007 single, Heart Shaped Glasses. However, in late 2008, Evan announced that they were taking time out from their relationship to concentrate on work. On the acting front, she began her career by appearing in video clips for bands like The Pet Shop Boys and Aerosmith. Coincidentally, she also featured in the video to the single Miami by Will Smith, opposite whom she would star in the big screen comedy Hitch seven years later in 2005. It is not that serious. Oh! Having worked with Will a second time, she was angling for a hat trick. Just one of those people that you just, everybody loves them for all the right reasons, because in the best way possible, he, you, you get what you see, you know what I mean? He's just that open-hearted, beautiful, you know, person. And, um, and yeah, I, I just, I hope to work with him again, actually. It was the first of two comedies that she starred in that year. Her next visit to the red carpet was to celebrate the premiere of the Wendell Baker story, written and directed by brothers Luke and Andrew Wilson, and co-starring the even more famous brother, Owen Wilson. Eva got to play Luke's love interest in the tale about an ex-con working in a retirement home. I love how they all have their own look, you know, and their own senses of humor. Um, um, and they're just great guys. You know, they come from a really great family. They're kind of like old cowboys. I always call them old cowboys because they're manly men, but yet they're, they're really chivalrous. Live came to me about a year and a half ago, and I read the script, and I was like, oh my god, I have to play this role. And what's going on with this movie? Like, what's the reality? Is it, is it, who's making it? What's going on? So I called my agent, and I was like, you know, and they're like, well, they don't actually have the financing for it yet. Um, but let's see what we can do. And then basically I became involved as a producer and I put my name on the film to literally make it happen. It was my first time green lighting a film, which I'm really happy about. Vision. Film because I actually, in this film, I make fun of it. I'm not, this is a satire to me. Um, this is a funny film to me. It's very serious and it's dark, but it's funny because I in no way want to be like my character, Katie Corbet. I, I am an ambitious woman and I'm independent. And, I'll do, you know, I'll, I'll follow my goals and blah, 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 but, uh, you know, the, I have limits and, and I have what I think I have is integrity and hopefully I'll keep that. You know. That year she also starred in Ghost Rider, We Own the Night and The Cleaner, as well as making an uncredited appearance in Knocked Up. In 2008 she joined Meg Ryan, Annette Benning, Deborah Messing and Jada Pinkett Smith in a rework of the 1939 film The Women. And her big projects in 2009 include Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans, and Queen of the South.